Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is <laughs> Timo Stollenberg. Uh, I'm a Plon core developer. I work with Plon since uh, nine years. And I'm uh, leading the uh, Plon continuous integration and uh, testing team. So we make sure that Plon, the, the software, keeps, a good, keeps up the good quality that, that we have in there. And the, the reason why I got interested in, in topics like testing and continuous integration was that, um, that like everybody else, I had like projects over the years and some went good, some went bad. I made mistakes like everybody else did and I wanted to uh, yeah, improve myself and continuous integration and testing was a way of, of doing that. So um, every time you start a project, I, I still really like my job like probably everybody else in the Plone community uh, does, at least as what, what my feeling is. So um, I'm still very enthusiastic if I start a new project. Uh, and every time I start a new project, like you have like the best intentions, right? You have like what you want your software to be is like first thing it, it should work, right? That that's a plus, definitely. Um, it should be bug free, whatever that means. It should be fast, of course. Everybody likes fast software, right? Um, the code should be maintainable because we want to be flexible. Agile is is pretty common. Agile. Um, approaches are pretty common, so we want to refactor uh, our code and um, change it accordingly to uh, um, the demands of the customer. The code should be readable because it should be easily um, easy to grasp what, what the code does and everything. It should be, of course, well documented. Uh, and in the end, it should be in time and in budget. So this is what, what, what the wishful thinking is, what everybody wants at the beginning. I never heard any developer who said, I don't want any, any of those. Um, and then there's the real world. Um, so real world is like, like this, and all these are like true stories. Um, so you go like as a developer, Monday morning, you come into the office and, you know, fresh start, and you, you check out your, uh, your Git repository, Git repository and the build is broken. So um, what do you do? You look at the code and, and like after 15 minutes or half an hour or whatever, you, you, you see a commit that might have broken your build. So you call the developer or write him an email and say, hey, I think you're, you, you broke my build. I can't, I can't start my Zope instance any longer. So then the developer says, uh, no, it, it works on my machine. I mean. It, it wasn't me, so you start discussing like for half an hour or whatever. So you look into their code and you will figure it out at some point, but it will take time, okay? Um, then you, you're finally able to uh, like maybe deploy the software and then it has like really bad performance or you run into lots of bugs. So your, your project manager really gets angry because like, uh, yeah, you ship buggy software and everything, the customer gets angry. Um, and you want to uh, maybe uh, fix code. I mean, if the performance is bad, you want to fix it. So um, then you, 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 you look at parts of the code where you, see, where, where you might see or might expect that this is uh, responsible for, for, slow, uh, for the slow performance. Um, but you can't really, the code is pretty unreadable. You can't really refactor it because if you start like uh, changing something, everything breaks down. Um, so you can't really refactor uh, things. So in the end, this leads to projects that are over time and over budget because nobody expects you to like uh, spend two weeks or four months or whatever just fixing bugs, right? Um, oh, yeah, I, <laughs> I forgot those. Um, so what's the problem be between those two, like between the the, the wishful thinking and the real life. It's, it's assumptions, basically. Because like, when, when we start a new project and you, you just assume that like, you have all smart programmers and they don't, don't introduce any bugs, you, you expect them to write clean code that, that is like, maintainable and that is bug-free, um, that developers don't make mistakes, um, that the software works as expected and everything. But this is what, what most people do actually. I mean, they say, okay, at the start at, of a project, I want to, we want to have bug free code and everything because everybody wants, but they just assume that this will magically happen. Um, and this is unfortunately not how it goes. So, um, 
building high quality software is is really hard it's not like I, I won't present you any like silver bullets like saying hey I have this cool software you have to buy and then uh, all your problems will be gone um, it's it's hard work but I, I will try to show you how like continuous integration uh, can help you to build better software because it helped me to uh, build better software so um, what what should like continuous integration um, do like it should it should uh, help you to reduce assumptions and to reduce risk and replace them with some kind of proof. Whatever that means, I will come to that later. Um, so, what do you need? What are the basic ideas of, um, of continuous integration? The idea is that you have an automated uh, build and set of tests that can actually tell you if your, if your software breaks. This is the basics. Um, sorry, uh, there's no way around it like you have to write tests if you want like continuous integration right and if you want to have bug free software then you have to write some tests there's just no way around it so uh, the goal of continuous integration is like um, pushing this idea of having like uh, an automated build and test system a bit further um, with uh, by having the goal that that the software is proven to work with every new change this means that every time you uh, a developer does a commit, you want to make sure that the software works as expected, that it's not broken, and that you can somehow prove that this is the case, right? So you don't break things. Um, one important thing is that continuous integration is, an, um, is a practice. It's not a tool. It's not like Jenkins or whatever, or Travis. It's, it's really a tool, um, where, and uh, it's really a practice, sorry. Um, and for that, you need an agreement on the team. So, so before you start a project, you have to sit together uh, with the team and, and think about ways how you can build quality software. And continuous integration just helps you with that. But there's no way around like having a, an agreement on the team because you have to decide what you want before you can actually make a continuous integration server or whatever test what you, what you want, right? So this is the first step. Um, and if you... If you want to, to do this practice of continuous integration, there are a few really simple rules. Like the first rule is um, do not break things. Makes sense. <laughs> but if you have a, uh, like an automated build and a test, you actually um, can prove that, that you don't break things, right? You don't expect that if you, if you commit something, you don't just expect that you don't break things, but you can, you see if you break things. Um, so what you should do is, um, before you push something to uh, a repository, um, you should run your, your tests locally first, so you don't break things, right? Then you should um, wait um, until the, the automated build and test um, set run through. Um, and one very important lesson that I had to learn on the hard way is um, never go home on a broken build, or do not push something and then go home and expect that the uh, build will be green, right? Because then you will break it for everybody else and that kind of sucks, especially if you have like distributed teams across time zones and continents and everything, then you can't just expect that everybody goes home, right? So the se th second uh, rule is, um, if things are broken, don't make it more complicated. This is related to, to some of the uh, things that I said before don't check in on a broken build. I mean, the only way to, to achieve that is if you wait until the build passes and then commit on it. Um, what, what you need for that is, of course, like a, a fast build and fast feedback. In Plone, for instance, the, the core dev uh, builds, they take an hour. Right now, we are working on that. We will improve that, um, I promise. Um, but this is how it is right now. So, so what I do if I do like core dev development, or what I, what I used to do is like, I don't want to wait an hour, so I, so I was pushing and pushing, and, and then you see like at some point, oh, the build broke. But then you have like six additional commits, so you have to, to look at it and figure out what, what, what actually broke, right? So that kind of sucks. So don't try, try to don't check in on a broken build. That's easier if you have a fast CI system. And the third rule is um, that if you broke the build, fix it as soon as possible. Um, First thing that if is um, that if you break the build, you should take responsibility, no matter if you're really responsible for it or anything else broke. I mean, it's hard to write tests that are really reliable. We have 
those tests that are unreliable in, in Plone. Still, I worked a lot on that, but sometimes it happens that the test just fails. But um, if, if it was your commit, you are responsible, because if, if you're not responsible, then nobody is, right? And you have a broken build, so we have a problem that we don't want to have. Um, if you broke something, that's, that not, that's not really like a real bad thing. I mean, the CI server is, is there to tell you that you broke something, right? It's not like, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, what, but what the problem is that if you, if, you, if, you, if you broke the build, then you should be prepared to revert your commit if that's necessary. You have like, um, there are different approaches, but most people say that you should like fix things within like 10 minutes or half an hour or something like that. And if you're not, um, if that's not possible, then just revert your fix to make sure that other people can work. Because if they don't commit on a broken build, they essentially can't work. And this is also something that is best practice for CI is that if someone, someone broke a build, the entire team stops working and, and works on fixing that build. That's not always necessary because sometimes like these are easy fixes and you see immediately what you did wrong. But if there's a serious problem, then everybody in the team should stop and work on fixing the build because we want a, a green build all the time. Uh, and one of the last rule is don't comment out failing tests because it's really tempting. And this is what happens often that you break the build and you, you know that the other developers, uh, they want to, to go further, so you comment out the test and then you forget about this and this is uh, also not, nothing you should, should really do. Um, so how to get started actually with uh, continuous integration? Uh, I, will, I will do one example of a setup that I usually do. Um, there are plenty of CI servers and plenty of um, different uh, uh, yeah, different systems out there, um, but this is this is my setup. But um, it's it's more about the uh, um, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's replaceable. So what 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 you of course need is like a central repository for everybody. But, but I just expect that everybody works nowadays with uh, with uh, version control and everything. Um, so I I choose Big Bitbucket because they offer private repositories and it's uh, for free in comparison to 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 uh, GitHub. And what you need is a post commit hook. Um, if you if you read like the documentation for Jenkins, for instance, they they tell you that you should run your tests on a regular level, like every I don't know every ten minutes or something. But there's a problem if you if you run your test every ten minutes, then you are, you might not be able to see which commit broke the build, right? Because if two people commit within this ten minutes and the build is run, you have two commits and one of them broke the build and you have no way of seeing that. So this is really essential for a working CI system that you have this post commit hook. And it's really easy to set up for every system. It's an SVN, you have a post commit hook in, in Git, in Mercurial and everything. Um, in Bitbucket, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very easy. You just go to the admin page and uh, to the hooks and add Jenkins there. If you have a private Jenkins instance, um, then it's a bit more work because you have to add a token and everything. But that's also not too hard to do. Um, then you have like the, the Jenkins server, which I um, uh, will cover in detail in a minute. Uh, so this is basically where you, where you run your build and your test. And then um, something that's also very, very important is to give feedback to the developers. If you have a CI system and it's just like, it requires you to, to go there and look if the build is like green, uh, it's no to, it's to no, it's to no, to no use. Um, so you have to notify the developers. Um, usually you do that by email. There are other options. You can have it like push a message on IRC um, or have a big monitor uh, in your office or whatever, but email is uh, the, the usual way of doing things. And that's also pretty easy, for instance, to do this, this with Jenkins because Jenkins out of the box gives you the ability to just send emails. Um, uh, so you can uh, send the email to a mailing list or you can send the email to a single developer that broke the build to let him know that he broke the build. So this is really the most basic setup and it's really easy to set up, right? So what does Jenkins then actually do or the CI server? So the most important thing is of course that you, that you run your tests, right? Because without tests, um, you just assume that your system works 
and you, we want proof, right? We don't, we don't want wishful thinking. We want, we want proof that our system works. So um, if we run tests, we can prove that our system works. Um, and that's also pretty easy to set up for, for Plone. We have this collective XML um, test report plugin for the, for the Zoop test runner that uh, spits out um, uh, an, an output that Jenkins can read and process. And then you have those nice statistics and graphs. Um, and you and something that is also important um, is uh, of course test coverage because you you it's not enough that you have just tests you want to know that that you have a decent test coverage to te so that your tests will tell you if things break if you have like only 10% test coverage there's no way that those tests will really um, tell you uh, if the systems fail I mean 10% test coverage is better than having no tests at all but um, still there that's a big part of the system is untested, basically, so you don't, um, you will not notice if you broke anything. Um, the second thing is um, acceptance tests. Acceptance tests um, differ from the other tests because, um, like unit and integration tests or even functional tests, they don't, they, they tell you if you break things. But acceptance tests. Um, the idea of acceptance test is that you have a, a specification, you get a specification from your customer, and you test that actual specification. So you have um, something like if you want to uh, test a login for, for instance, you have like um, this, this text above, you say given a login form, when I enter valid credentials, then I'm locked in. This is something that everybody reads, uh, that everybody can read and, and even write. Um, and we have, uh, thanks to Asko Suka, a uh, robot framework um, in, in Plone that you can use to write those kinds of tests. And if, you, if every specification that you have, if, every, every, if you have an um, acceptance test for every user story, say, then you have with that proof that your system does what your customer expected to do, right? You have a formal specification, and when you run those tests on a continuous level, then you have proof that the system does what it is what it what it should do, right? Without acceptance tests, you don't you don't have that. You have you have proof that the system does what what the developer expects to do. But with acceptance tests, you have really the the proof. And if the, if if the customer then comes along and say, hey, the, our system does not work as expected, then you can go with with the customer to to your acceptance test and discuss is this what the system is supposed to do, and do we have to change that? But if, if not, then I have to prove that the system works as uh, we agreed on. So we replace assumptions with proof. Um, another thing is um, static code analysis. Um, in, in the Python world, we have like uh, certain tools like PEP8 and Flake8, uh, PEP8 and PyFlakes, and Flake8, which does both of it. Um, we have like for JavaScript, we have, we have JSLint and CSSLint and many other tools. Um, so um, where we can, where we can, um, where we see, um, um, where we can measure the quality of our code. I mean, the, the thing about um, code analysis is that you can have the really crappy code that is PEP8 compliant. So if you have like, um, if your code is PEP8 compliant, that does not mean that that you have like clean code that is easily readable, right? The only thing that code analysis analysis can really give you is pointers where your code might have a problem. Like uh, I with with Hector yesterday, I discussed the uh, the famous 80 character limit in uh, <laughs> in PEP8. Um, I don't want to discuss this here, but like my point was basically that if you if you go beyond this 80 character limit, this might show you that you have like too many if and thens or whatever, for instance, or or you have like an if whatever and whatever, and this clause is unreadable. So you have to, you might have to do something about this. That doesn't mean that if your line is 81 characters long, that 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 there's a problem, right? There's a possible problem, but there's no there's no code analysis does not give you proof that there's a problem. So it just gives you a pointer where you might have a problem. Um, one other thing that is important about code analysis is readability. I mean, uh, Python code is pretty readable. We all agree on that, and this is why we why we like Python. Um, but if you if you have like different different personal preferences, for instance, in code, that makes code more unreadable. So you need an agreement on the team, and you can't just assume that all programmers 
have the same style, you need an agreement. And we have kind of those, this kind of agreement in the, in the Python community, which is PEP8, right? So this is also something where we um, replace assumptions with proof or uh, where we can do that. Um, another thing that, that I, uh, another kind of problem that I usually run into uh, in projects is um, performance, right? I mean, performance is, uh, you, it's hard to say, like, I want a fast system, right? Because you, you need, um, uh, you need a goal. Some, if, if, you, if you do a, um, uh, if you have a contract with, with a customer, sometimes they say, okay, we want every, every uh, page rendered within like 500 milliseconds or something. Then you need proof for that. But usually it's, it's just that customer come and say, yeah, we want the system to be fast, right? Whatever that means. Um, so this is also something that is assumptions usually. Um, but you can have proof. You can run um, uh, performance tests. Um, Jamie, uh, the, the tool that I use these days is JMeter. I also use um, the Grinder um, and some, try some other tools. But what's nice about JMeter is that it comes with a desktop application where you can basically click together your, uh, your test plan. It's really easy to do. And you can not only run um, those JMeter tests from your desktop system, but you can also run it on Jenkins and make Jen Jenkins run it. So you can really click together your test code um, push it to your repository and then make Jenkins run it on a continuous basis. The problem with um, uh, with performance tests is that they usually take some time, especially, especially if you if you want to hit the systems with a lot of users. So you, you need a dedicated system to test against, um, and you can't um, you can't use the Jenkins machine if other um, jobs run there, right? Because then you won't get um, decent results. But um, if you run those performance tests on a regular level on your continuous integration server, then you can replace the assumption that your system is fast with the proof that it is fast or that it reacts in in uh, yeah inside a, in, um, yeah that it reacts in a certain time. So the next thing is um, documentation. Documentation is also everybody loves documentation. Everybody wants to write documentation. Um, if, if you do test-driven development, um, you basically have um, um, developer documentation, right? Because like, if you want to know how, how a system works, um, what I usually do is I, I, I look for tests, and if there are like decent tests, then you, then you know how to, how to work with the system. So you have like this lower level developer documentation. Um, you can achieve with, with like writing tests. But there's, there are also other kinds of documentation need, needs that you have in a, pro in a project. For instance, if you have like uh, robot framework acceptance tests, you, you might want to have them in a nice format, which you can give to your customers so they can have a look. Um, we have this technology, um, for instance, to include robot framework tests, even with screenshots in a Thwinx documentation. This is what I, what I do in projects these days. I have like, I start a new user story to implement it. I, I write the, um, the acceptance test. Uh, I make sure that the, the robot tests do some screenshots. I integrate those screenshots into, into Swings. So my project manager um, can, can just go to this, to this URL and look at those and see if that's, that's what, what he expects me to do. Um, so this is kind of like a documentation. There's, of course, some kind of other documentation that you need to write that has no, like, tight bindings to the code. Um, but what, what Jenkins can, can do for you is, is um, auto-generate this Swings documentation, right? Because it's really easy to just, just have a, a, a Jenkins job that runs a bash script that creates a Jenkins documentation and uploads it automatically to, uh, to a server. That's really two lines of, of bash script. So that's really easy to do. Um, then the last thing is um, notifications. I already um, talked a bit about about, uh, about that. There is the Jenkins X email plugin, for instance, that you can use, which allows you to send emails um, in a really flexible way. You can you can decide, for instance, what you do if if a build breaks or if if the build uh, is fixed again or if you made things worse by by introducing. Um, new test failures or if you improved it. So you can choose for everything that might happen on your Jenkins instance to send an email and you can choose what to include 
for instance, in, in the body of the email. Um, and you can choose um, where to send those emails. You can say that, that you want to send emails to the developer, your internal developer mailing list, only if, if the build breaks. But for a developer, you, you might want to always send an email. To, to let the developer know that everything went went okay, right? So that's that's a real real flexible system, and it's really essential. The notifications are really essential that you give rapid feedback, as I said before. You don't want to wait an hour um, as a developer um, because this is like like in test driven development where you want to have like um, really short cycles. That's the same in uh, continuous integration. You want to have like short cycles at best. In the the CI system should give you a response within 10 minutes. More is, is then hard to do. Um, also, it's um, beyond like the emails. Uh, Jenkins can become your communication platform for all kind of um, users in your system. You not only have like developers, but you have like project managers that might want to know about like the software quality, right? And you give them a way to measure that by like your code coverage or your static code analysis and stuff like this so that the project man manager can go there or you can tell your project manager hey we, we had a real tight schedule and we are a bit low on our test coverage so we we want to catch up so let us um, uh, let us work for for a week on like our test coverage um, so we can improve that and the project manager can then actually see that you improve things right the project man manager co can go to Jenkins to look up the uh, the latest, um, um, the latest acceptance tests and stuff like this. Also, of course, for the developers, developers can go there and get get tons of information. Um, um, taking continuous integration a bit further is the uh, you might have heard about that term already is continuous deployment or DevOps. The idea is that if you have a an automated build. Um, which are good with, with decent test coverage, so you can um, um, so uh, yeah, so so you can you can tell if the tests pass that the system works as expected, right? Then you can just push it a bit further and say, okay, if if we are sure that our software does what it is supposed to do, then we can just push a button and deploy, like, just like this, right? Because if we know that our software works, why why shouldn't why should we wait? To deploy things, um, so you can you can even extend that and say, okay, it's not the end. The continuous integration is not the end, but push it further. Um, so what what I usually have is um, what 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 Jenkins allows you to do with this build pipeline plugin is basically to to create a build pipeline, a custom build pipeline. And what I usually have is like the first step is are the tests right because they have to run fast. Um, usually, I run only um, integration tests, not the, not the acceptance tests, because they take too long to give the developers a, a quick feedback. Um, the next step is then the uh, acceptance test, the code analysis, and the test coverage. Because and, uh, and the good thing is with this pipeline, you can run them in parallel, right? So if, if you have a multi-core machine, that really speeds up the process. Um, then you run yeah, code analysis, test coverage, the acceptance test, and if all those passed, then I have a, a really simple Jenkins job that says just release, for instance. So you can do uh, with Zest Releaser or, or, or John Make Release, you can, you can just make easily make releases from Jenkins. So you, so you push a button and it does releases, uploads them to your internal PyP server, and then you have another job where you, where you say um, deploy to staging. Or you have a, a button that says deploy to live, right? I mean, the, the thing is that uh, this build pattern um, uh, system does not force you to do that. I mean, if you use that, this does not mean that for every commit that, that is green, it will deploy to the live server. You, you still can do this manually, but the thing is that usually if you have like system administrators in a, um, in a team, then there's usually one person that is responsible for like doing the deployment and everything. And if you automate those uh, things, others can also like click that button. Even your project manager can click that button. Right? I mean, somebody has to be around, but, but <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's up to you to decide that. Um, but that, that's really a nice thing. I mean, what, what I usually do is like we have a, a live server and a staging server and like a, a playground or dev server, and the Jenkins job always pushes to the dev server because it's just for the developers, um, so you can easily do that, right? Um, and I usually have like this button to deploy to staging and to to life especially. Um, but you can do that. 
Um, so what do we get from like my, my first slide, from the wishful thinking? Um, it's basically really the, the same slide, so <laughs> you know that I don't, don't trick you. Um, we, want working, uh, we want a working system, right? So if we have enough tests and we run them on a continuous basis, we, we have really proved that we have a working system, actually. Oops, that was too far. Oops. <laughs> I don't have a working system here. <laughs> yeah, it's not tested. That's a problem. Oh, okay. I can just use the first slide. <laughs> so we we have a working system if we have like tests. Um, we will never have a bug-free system. I, I think we all know that if you are, have some experience with programming, it will never be bug-free, but what a continuous integration system or what testing can give you is um, catching the bugs early. So they are, they're easy to fix and cheap to fix. We all know that if you, if you um, catch a bug early, that is far easier to fix than if you catch it after you deploy it and the, the customer, customer yells at you, right? Um, then we, have a, we can have a fast system if we have a definition of what, what fast means for us and we can run our, um, our uh, performance tests on a continuous basis to monitor it, that. And that's pretty handy actually, even if the, in the development phase, because then you see at what point you might introduce um, code that leads um, to, 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 to a bad performance, right? And where, where the problems lay. I mean, there's, as I said, there's no silver bullet in that. You still have, if you see that, you still have to, uh, at some point, um, go to a profiler and, and find out where, where the real problem is. But you see this earlier, so you can react. You see when you introduce the problem. What, what I usually had at projects is that we were working for a long time developing software, and then we, we deployed it like on alpha phase, for, for a couple of users, and then we said, oh, the performance is bad. So we started to write some performance tests. And then you, you spend like a year or something to work on the software, and you have to figure out where the problem lays. If you see immediately where the, problems was, where the problem was intr introduced, and you, see you are working on that, then it's really easy to fix, and it's way cheaper to fix. So we can have fast software. Um, if we do like code analysis, we can have kind of maintainable code. Also, tests take a bit, um, uh, play a big role in that. If you have testable code, then you usually have uh, a better architecture than without tests, because tests force you to, to have a decent architecture and everything. Um, and since we're testing um, the agreement of the team in terms of, um, of coding best practice, um, we have more readable code, of course. Um, then, as I said, before we, we have like documentation, like at least for developers, and if we have um, if we have acceptance tests, then we have documentation about what the system uh, should do. I, I had like projects where where I came came in, where where I did not develop, uh, where I had to extend um, a system, and um, it was not working as expected, more or less. But I had like the customer was telling me no, this is not what what we wanted. So I looked at the tests and the tests were actually failing, and I looked then at the code, and the code was doing something else, so I had like three options to go with, right? <laughs> and the reason was, they, they even had tests in this project, but, but it was not run on a continuous level, so I never could see when it actually broke. So um, if you have a continuous integration system and you run tests on a continuous level, then you have a documentation on what the system is supposed to do. So, so it is documented. Um, yeah, if you have all these things, then it's easier for your project manager, uh, either if, if, if you do an agile approach or, or you do a more classic approach, then it's easier to, uh, um, yeah, to, to, to finish a project in time, right? Because you don't have to add at the end like uh, a couple of uh, weeks or months to fix bugs, because you, you fix them right from the start. And it helps you to, uh, uh, to finish the project in budget. <laughs> Now I'm behind. Oops. Uh, again, okay, this was just the last slide. Um, yeah, this was it, and I and I hope I could could show you how you can um, 
how you can improve things. I don't expect you, if you if you are like maybe still a bit new to testing, I don't expect you to just uh, go ahead and implement everything. I, I did this one off, one step after another. I got into testing and then I run my tests on, on a CI server and then I thought about like acceptance tests and performance tests and and you have like the CI server for everything basically and it really becomes like uh, the central piece of uh, of your software development and it can re my experience is that it can really improve um, your software a lot and it can help you a lot it shouldn't scare you like everything just do whatever you think makes sense um, or or work on on like I I I um, yeah I said that I had those problems right and that I that I um, that I talked about. The, these were real problems. I was not lying. So I wanted to to work on that and improve that. And CI um, helped me to do that. And I and I hope uh, I could uh, convince you that that is worth uh, investing maybe some time to work on it. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, a lot of us um, work in systems that have databases. How do you would make the transitions and the schemas of the databases? <laughs> This is one of the reasons why I'm really, really happy that we use with uh, that that we work with uh, Zoop and Plone because it's really, really, really easy. Because like we have the um, the Zoop test runner, so you can set up a database from the from the scratch for for each test. So you can be sure that you test the right thing and not th uh, something that is only on your uh, on your deployment. Uh, and it's and we don't have this problem of uh, mig having to migrate schemas. Um, if you're interested, there's uh, there are a couple of uh, really good books about the topic. Um, one is called Continuous Deployment, which also covers um, with, with which has an entire chapter about um, migrating uh, relational database schemas. And uh, to be honest, I, I just skipped that um, chapter <laughs> because, we, as I said, we don't have the problem. That's that's really nice. If you have the ZUDB, you don't have to migrate the schema. You just change uh, something and then you push it and then there's nothing, I mean, it's just attributes on an object, so um, you can remove them, you can add new ones, uh, the ZUDB will, uh, will work that out. So um, that's a pretty specific problem, um, but I'm not sure if CI can even help you because this, yeah, I mean, this is like what, what, what the conti t continuous deployment people say is, is that you should automate everything, right? So you, you need a, a system that helps you to do these um, these migrations and you should automate them so you just click a button but that's pretty hard to do if you have relational databases it's a lot harder than um, than uh, when you work with uh, with the ZODB so sorry if I can't really help you <laughs> with that um, yeah but but uh, uh, I forgot to to add a uh, final slides about like two books that I that are that are read that are really good. Um, they are both from the Martin Fowler signature series. Um, they are called continuous deployment and continuous integration. Um, I will I will tweet uh, those two. They are not about uh, uh, they are not about like any technology. It's really just about the um, the process. Um, but they are really good and I can re can really um, recommend them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, to, I, I told you the other day when we were discussing this on, on email that we should just drink beer and then discuss this because there's no use to discussing PEP8 things without getting drunk at the same time. <laughs> we drink beer again. Yes, we will. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you have any 
any result, uh, like some statistics or something, some numbers on how the the adoption of continuous integration does lead to a lower rate of def defects uh, or a lower time to deliver? Um, lower time to deliver? I'm not sure. I, I mean, the thing is, there, there are some studies uh, from, from uh, a couple of universities um, about test-driven development and how you could uh, reduce the number of bugs in your, in your software. And what they're basically saying, what they're all saying is, is that the more experienced your programmers are, the more you can gain from test-driven development. Um, but usually, um, you, you will gain something. You will not really lose time. If you, if you usually talk with people about test-driven development, um, they say, oh, I can't do this because like, my customer does not pay for it. And um, I, my experience was really the opposite, that, that test-driven development can really speed up your, uh, your development. And all the, those studies more or less say that. They say that if you're unexperienced, then it will more or less take the same time in the end. And if you're experienced, it will really speed up your, your process. But um, for the rest, I can't tell you any, any numbers. Okay, then thank you.